If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. Welcome back. My final guest is Tony Christie. Now, Tony is a worldwide renowned singer-songwriter whose career has spanned over five decades. He is most famous for his song, Is This The Way To Amarillo, which was re-released to Comic Relief in 2005 with a music video which featured Peter Kay. Earlier this year, Tony released his 19th studio album, Now's The Time, which critics are calling his best to date. I met with Tony during his 50th anniversary tour in Swindon. Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an absolute honour to have you on. So, Tony, how did your singing ambition first start for yourself? I think it started when I was uh, a teenager, I suppose, yeah. When I was a teenager, I, I sort of uh, got into the music. Um, I sort of... Uh, rock and roll, when, when rock and roll yeah. sort of started, that's when I sort of took an interest in, uh, in music. But I used to play when I was a little, little boy. I was always able to play the piano by ear, I could never read music, but I used, I used to play uh, piano and uh, pick out tunes and uh, my dad always used to get people in to say, and then make me play a tune, you know, it was this sort of embarrassing thing. Um, and I sang in the, in the choir at school and, 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 and at school and I sort of, I drifted into music basically. Um, and was always singing, always singing, I was surrounded by music, my dad, my dad played the piano. My grandfather played the, p we had a harmonium at home, um, which you pumped with your foot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my, my grandfather used to play that. Uh, we had a piano as well. Uh, my grandmother on my dad's side, my Irish side of the family, uh, she played the fiddle in a Cayley band. My grandfather on my Irish side played the uh, squeeze box in a Cayley band. So uh, I was literally surrounded by music. I, I grew up with music. My, my uncles, one of my uncles in particular was a, a good singer, uh, my Uncle Jack, and uh, I used to think he sounded like uh, uh, Richard Tauber, the uh, Austrian tenor. So was he quite inspirational to you then, do you think? In um, I always thought that, I, I just thought that, um, that everybody sang or played an instrument, because I, I grew up with everybody either singing or playing instruments, so that I thought that, that was, that's what people did. Yeah, but I suppose that wasn't the norm as such, was it? No, I mean the rest, don't forget my, my grandfather worked down the pit, uh, my uncles, because like we lived, while my dad was away in the Air Force, he was a professional Air Force geezer, um, we lived with uh, my grandfather, uh, so with my uncles and aunt, we, we all lived in the same house, so uh, and they, they were either working down the pit, and uh, so uh, it was a sort of a mixed bag, really. So was there any sort of inspirational bands at the time that really shaped the way your music initially went? Um, in the early days, uh, sort of rock and roll first hit me when I started. Uh, but for, I was always, I was always had my ear in the radio. I was a, 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 even at uh, junior school, I'd, I'd get, as soon as I got home, my, my head was in the, in the radio, listening to all the old radio shows. But uh, when I got to sort of 12 and rock and roll came in, I, was, I started listening and that excited me. And my dad saw, sort of saw what was happening and was a little bit up. A bit. So he got his record collection, which he collected while he was tra traveling in the world, and brought all these 78s, which he, he put into a big pile. And he said, right, son, he said, uh, that, that's real music. He says, don't listen to that rock and roll, that's rubbish. <laughs> he said, uh, that, listen to that. It was all this big big band American stuff, so uh, basically that's what I, then I started listening to this um, American uh, big band music, and uh, the music I liked, uh, well, it, they always had singers, and it was always um, like Harry James band music, uh, vocal refrain by uh, Frank Sinatra, say, and uh, that's when I got hooked on people like Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and uh, Peggy Lee and all these great singers, and uh, from that moment my my goal was to was to uh, to sing with a big band. So take me back to the sixties when your sort of initial success started. What was it like for you? Well, it was the late sixties. I mean, don't forget, I started uh, in the sort of nineteen sixty one. So this is my fiftieth year in the business, and I, I started out with groups. So I went through various 
lead singer with groups, and uh, so I always had my sort of f friends around me. I was always protected, if you like. So uh, that's how I sort of got over my shyness, and the fact that we used to work the working men's clubs, and, the, and then gradually, gra uh, as we, as I got sort of more confident and a bit more uh, polished, uh, we graduated into doing um, cabaret, uh, more sophisticated, entertaining. Um, and st but still, at the back was always this shyness, and it took years and years and years to uh, to get rid of it. So lack of confidence, I suppose. Do you think that's what it was? I yeah. Think so, yeah. yeah. And if we go then to sort of the early 1970s, wh what sort of inspired you in that era as well? The early 70s. Um, well, originally I wanted to be a, a singer with a big band, but of course they, the big bands disappeared because the rock and when rock and roll came out, that was the, the, the death knell of, of, of big bands. Um, so I went down the pop side and I started doing pop music because I was in pop bands. And uh, I found out that, and particularly when I got married, I found out that you had, you had to go where the money was. So I, I, I started doing, uh, singing uh, pop songs and, and making pop records. And that's, that's how I got my success and that's how I provided for my family. Right, and okay. So I, I carried on down the pop, the pop side. And was that initially in, in the UK the success was, or was that abroad in Europe? Um, I was very fortunate that when I had my first hit records, which was in uh, 1971. I, uh, there were hits. There were hits in, uh, in those days. English hits were always mm. hits around the world. So uh, there were sort of hits crept onto the continent and then became hits in sort of Australia, New Zealand, and the Far East and all these places. So um, from 71, I was sort of thrown from the cabaret circuit onto the world stage and started doing uh, world tours. So. Uh, that's that's when it changed big time. Yeah. So tell me about some of your success in in Europe then as well, because th you had a lot of success in Europe, didn't you? Yes, and, and in fact, uh, it carried on when when it went quiet for me over here. It carried on in Europe. It, it, um, uh, it never stopped. Basically, uh, I mean, in this pr profession anyway, that's uh, it, it's, it's very hard to, to sustain that high level because it's a very fickle business, particularly the pop side. So you get your peaks and troughs, and so I've had several of both. And uh, fortunately, the, my, my peaks stayed longer on the continent than they did uh, over here. So when it went very quiet for me here, which was in the late sort of uh, 70s, I suddenly had started having big, big hits in places like Germany and Austria, Switzerland, and those, those areas. So um, I was able to carry on touring and um, started then going further afield and doing the Australian tours and the New yeah. Zealand tours and all this kind of thing. And um, why do you think Germany was so big for you then? I mean, what was... I don't know. They took to me very, very, very quickly. Yeah. And they, they've never let go. It's, it's, uh, I've been having hits there for 40 years. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, I was having hits in, in the sort of late 17, 1979. I had a big, big hit over there. Um, and then followed by a big, uh, big uh, album, a big album. Um, which, which gave me a sort of f another five years of, of touring around around uh, that area. And would you say you you know you released different material abroad than you would have Absolutely, done in the UK? Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. I mean, I I think it was about 1990 or just before 1990, 1989. I did a I did a I, I signed to a guy called Jack White, a very famous German record producer. And <laughs> I joined his l uh, record label, and uh, I became one of his stable. And his his big singer at the time, his big big artist, was David Hasselhoff. Right, right. And uh, so when when David Hasselhoff left, I became then the number one in Jack White's stable. Yeah. So and then I, so I got all his material, and, and I had monster monster hits, um, which uh, which basically I mean, in 1989 I had this big top five single in, in Germany, particularly in Germany, and it sold a million albums. The album from it sold a million. And at the time, nothing was happening for me in the, in, in the UK. And uh, we had a, a, a place in Spain, my mm. wife and I, and we um, decided to go and live there because I was doing so well abroad. And I said, I'm not doing any work over here. I have no, no record deal, no TV work. Uh, why don't we go and live in Spain? At, li at least I can travel 
Yes. And do my bits uh, everywhere else. Yeah. But at least have a nice climate to live in. How many years did you spend over in oh, Spain then? 15 years. Okay. 15 years, yeah. And you enjoyed it being over there? I did. Um, I always at the back of my mind, uh, I was sort of, you know, you want to be, f not famous, but you want to be appreciated in your, in your own land. And I always at the back of my mind, uh, with all the success I had everywhere else, there was always this niggle about not being appreciated where I wanted to be appreciated, which was the UK. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I, to be honest, I had a great, we had a great life in Spain and uh, my, my golf improved a hell of a lot because <laughs> I was playing two or three times a week in nice weather, you know. So and do you, do you miss it? I miss the climate, uh, yes I do. So what caused you then to move from Spain back to the I UK? I think it's all down to uh, the fact that in the end, I had a couple of nibbles in the, in the British charts. Uh, Jarvis Cocker wrote me a song called uh, uh, Walk Like a Panther, which he sent to me. And uh, I did that which, while I was still living in Spain and uh, it, it became a top 10 hit. This was uh, 1999, and I really should have come back to the UK and, and, and promoted it and worked on it and got my foot back in the, in the on my toe back in the, in the, in the market. But um, at the time when it all happened, I was, uh, I was on a nearly a 50-day European tour and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, do it, I was doing so well. So I missed that little opportunity. And basically what happened five years later was uh, that Peter Kay used Amarillo in uh, Phoenix Nights and then used it in, uh, in, uh, in the comic relief video. Um, and this, th that prompted me to, to move back. I thought I'm not missing this opportunity because when, when Amarillo went to number one, I, I had an album out which was being TV advertised at the same time and that was sitting at number three which went to number one at the same time as Amarillo single. And I had the number one down downloads for uh, ringtone, yeah. <laughs> ringtones. Yeah. And um, so I, I just said to my wife, you know, this is an, a golden opportunity for me to get my my British market back. So we came back. We didn't sell uh, our place in Spain. We came back, and we rented a, an apartment. And uh, I, I just carried on working. Okay, we're just going to take a break there, Tony. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website. Welcome back. I'm joined with my guest, Tony Christie. Now, Tony, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Now, just before the break there, we were talking about your success with uh, the Peter Kay track, mm. Amarillo. Now, that must have been a pretty crazy time for you at that time. Well, it was because um, at the time when it, when it all sort of happened, I, I was resigned to, being <coughs> to living in Spain. And I was thinking that my UK career was completely finished. And uh, one night I was watching, watching uh, Phoenix Nights because... I love that show because it, it <laughs> reminded me of the, of the days when I started out. Um, so uh, when he used that, I thought, well, that's, that's nice, you know, that's all I, th I thought, that's the, the end of it. Except that the next day, my son rang me and he said, Dad, he said, the, the phone has gone absolutely, it's gone mad, the phone. He says, I've been on the phone all day. He said, he said I've got disc jockeys from, from all around the UK ringing me. He says, they want to know, he said, they're being inundated with calls from little kids who want to know where they can buy that Peter K song, that record, by Keep Peter K. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not by Peter K. This is, he says, I know, but they, these little kids don't know that because they've, you know, they weren't even born when, when Amarillo was a hit the first time round. So that basically kicked it off. And uh, through that, um, I came back and did a tour. And uh, when it became number one, when I did my bit with Peter K on the... On the uh, moving walkway um, and I asked him at the time I, I said uh, I said what made you choose that song so he said uh, well he said I was when I was a little baby my mum had all your records she, said, and she used to put your records on to send me to sleep <laughs> I, th I, th I thought he was being, I thought he was being funny and he said no no I, th I thought well that's, that's a backhanded compliment but she said she put your records on yeah. to send him to sleep so um, 
Then he said, but I said, but why did you choose Amarillo? He said, well, I, I, he said there, there was a choice of two. It was either, it was either Amarillo or uh, I think it was uh, this old house, uh, Shaking Stevens. It was either this old house or Green Door, one of the Shaking Stevens tracks. And he said, uh, we tried it with uh, with the Shaking Stevens track with with, uh, with Matt, uh, Paddy, and Paddy couldn't remember the words, the lyrics. So he said we 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 chose instead we we, we went with the Amarillo because it, he says he says Amri he says Shalala he says you can't forget those lyrics Shalala is easy, that, and that's how it happened you know, so that's how it was chosen. So I mean this must have just you know projected you to a whole different level as well. And well, it different did. Fans. It did because it got me back. It got me back to the UK and uh, that, that was it. I, I decided to stay. Um, uh, and it did. It did actually. It, 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 it's, it's the spin-offs from it, because from that I did a, I, I always wanted to do a, 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 an album of, of, of standards. Um, so I did a, a little album with just a, a quartet, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, just sta jazz standards. Uh, so I got that off my, my chest. Uh, and um, then I, I, I was making this album uh, in Peter Gabriel's studio down in Somerset. And uh, on the way home one night, I uh, got the radio on, and uh, there was uh, a record on by Richard Hawley, Cole's Corner. And I listened to this in the car, and my son was with me. And, and uh, when it finished, I said to my son, I said, that's a great song. And I love the production. I said, I'd, I'd, I'd like to do that song, and I'd like that production. And he looked at me, he said, uh, he said don't you remember that, Dad? He, says, the, he said, Richard Hawley sent you that song about three years ago. And you never even played it. He says you were so busy with that when Amarillo was so big. He says, he says mind you, you were really busy. He says, so you never even listened to it. I said, uh, well, I'd still like to do it. So we did that. We got a meeting with Richard Hawley because I, I found out that he produced the produced it as well. Yeah. So I, I thought, well, I like the production. So um, we got a meeting. And I said, Richard, would you produce that that track for me? And they said, uh, uh, well, actually, he says. Why don't I make? He says, "Forget the album you're making now." He says, "Why don't I, I pr produce an album, a complete album, purely of, uh, of talent from Sheffield?" He says, "He says I'm from Sheffield. You're from Sheffield." He says, "We've got some great talent from there. Why don't we just do songs all pertaining to Sheffield people?" So I said, "Well, yeah, we'll look at it." So we went, th started going through all the songs, and you know, the, I mean, all the, the ABCs and the Ace and the Human Leagues and Joe Cocker and Jarvis Cockers, all the all the great artists that came from there, and um, and, and there were some great also writers that uh, just songs that nobody r had recorded. This album was uh, the, the Made in Sheffield, is it? Yeah, Made in Sheffield. Uh, critically acclaimed, wasn't it, by the Guardian? It was the best. R it's the best acclaimed album I've ever made in my life. I never expected it because it was complete. It was a complete, uh, completely away from what I was used to doing, which was the, the out and out pop music. It was a, a, an, a, uh, an album which, it, which Richard said, this, this is your album, you'll be very, very proud of this. You could, if you never make another album, you'll be very proud of this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got to be proud of that as I well. I am very proud yeah. of it, yeah. yeah. So the, your latest album, mm -hmm. um, how has that taken, been taken by uh, This was just to do, um, it was uh, an idea, as it's my 50th year, was I, st I, I said to my, my son, said, uh, I said, what can I do for, for the 50th anniversary? And he said, well, how about a 50-day tour? So I said, okay, if you can book 50 dates, if there are 50 dates, book them. So uh, he, he's booked 50 dates. And, uh, and I said, he said, what about a 50th anniversary album? So, something again, completely different. So we went back to the people, the, the two producers that produced my, that, that hit, that top 10 hit I had with uh, Walk Like a Panther, the Jarvis Cocker song. And we went back to them and said, "Do you fancy doing a doing a, an album of that sort of style, which is very '60s, uh, sort of that sort of sound that we wanted to get?" Yeah, yeah. And uh, they said, "Yeah." So, uh, and Mike Ward, who's the, as the, as the songwriting partner, he wrote, he's written all the songs on the album. And there's one collaboration. There's a Jarvis Cocker song on there, and there's a collaboration with Rasheen Murphy, and all the rest are written by Mike Ward. So. Um, that's that's what we set out to do, is and they're all brand new songs. That's right. What's some of your favourite tracks on there? Would you say there's a uh, quirk again? It's a very quirky, like they walk like a panther track. They're all very quirky. Um, uh, th there's a song called <laughs> "Get Christy," which Jarvis wrote, 
uh, using uh, using the theme, the music from Get Carter. Yeah. And we've actually got the permission from the the original the soundtrack from the film, and that is what we've used that, and I've sung over it. So we've got permission to do that, and it's called Get Christie. It's all very tongue in cheek, and um, I don't even p perform it on stage because it's it's a bit too, right. you know, a bit too <laughs> self indulgent. <laughs> okay, so I mean, yeah, like you said, there's a whole mixture of tracks it's on there, isn't there? I mean, right. then, then you, it's hard to nail it down exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, yeah. So some of the some of the, the crits were saying it's oh, it's it's northern soul, but it's there are a couple of sort of nods in that direction. But basically, it's, it's not Northern Soul. There's, there's, there's a bit of sort of Philadelphia type sound. There's a bit of bluesy type stuff. There's a bit of everything, really. Do you, do you find yourself being very critical on, y on yourself sometimes? You I, d I tend to push myself. Uh, I, I, st I tend to still sing or try to sing like I, like I sang 40 years ago. Um, and I still do. I still go for the big notes, the big high notes. Um, I've still got. Although I've lost maybe a couple of notes on the top end from, say, 40, f from the 60s and early 70s, I've gained four or five notes on the bottom end. So actually my voice, range-wise, is bigger now than it was 40 years ago. And, uh, you and, as, and it's more powerful now than it was years yeah, ago. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Is it just as powerful it's as it? It's absolutely yeah. frightening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what's some of your, your favourite parts of the, 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 the tour, then, of, of, of um, the night? Of the of the show, of yeah, the, the actual show, yeah. The, the, t the show is going, it's, it's doing, it's doing stuff that I never used to do. Is it's doing my album tracks, and, uh, and 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 doing the new stuff. I'm doing about eight songs, seven or eight songs for my my new album, and the and the reaction I'm getting is a, is a, you know, because you don't. I always was one of those. So they don't they don't want to hear new stuff because they're not used to it. They want to hear stuff that they know. Uh, my son taught me. He said, "No, Dad, they don't always want. They want to hear new. You've got a new album out." sing some of the new album so yeah. I'm doing it and I'm so surprised that people it's sounding like they know the songs <laughs> as, as if they bought the album so it's yeah. incredible and and so what's some of your new tracks you're bringing out soon or it, when's a new album coming out should I ask that first? Well I, I've got the one out that's out now which came out in January and I'm, I'm uh, plugging that and it's it's also being released in the next few months in Germany which I when I made the album it wasn't made for the German market right and they've gone mad they've listened to it and they've gone mad they yeah Sony music putting it out I've got a tour in, in Germany next April to promote it and um, the next thing is that the new album I've been uh, probably with the same same team same team of writers yeah. um, and new stuff. I, I don't. I don't want to do old stuff. Okay. I want to okay. do new stuff all the time. And what would you say to any aspiring musician or, or, or singer that's watching this right now? I mean, what, what's a, a good bit of advice to, for, from yourself to them? What to keep going? Well, yeah. Just, uh, same with me is, is if you believe in yourself, which I've always believed in myself, and you keep your head down and go for it, um, and that's what I've done. Just do what if you think it's right, go with your. Go with your gut, re gut feelings. I've always gone with my gut feelings, and I've, I've usually been right. It's never let you down. No. Never let me down yet. No. Okay. Well, Tony Christie, thank you so much for joining us today. Great pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Well, to find out more about Tony Christie, go to my website, themoreshow.co.uk, and look up Tony Christie under past guests. So until next time, thanks for watching. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows.